It was like an aha moment for me when I said, I need to have all of my content available to everybody and everybody has a phone. And with that, I said, we've got to just, we can't just be on radio anymore. We need to go to the people, not expect the people to come to us. Mm. And that, that was really a, a big moment for me several years ago. Welcome to Icons and Insights powered by C360, where the business of sports, technology, and broadcasting converge to create the immersive media economy. Now let's get into it with your hosts, Howard Wright and Cher Jones. So I'm super excited, Howard. Today's icon is Scott Kaplan. He's a multimedia entrepreneur and a veteran sports broadcast journalist who rocks the television, radio, and digital airwaves Monday to Friday with his show, Kaplan and Crew. He's a co-host on ESPN's LA Afternoon Drive show and the founder of a growing social debate platform called Sided. Tell me why, Howard. Why did you pick this guest? I know why, but you tell me why. So Scott Kaplan is a media mogul, and folks use that term, and they throw it around a little bit too loosely, but folks who are able to be a subject matter expert and thrive in different verticals with different disciplines, and now, as the, our theme share all along has been about convergence, mm -hmm. this convergence of podcast, radio show, TV show, influence, really talking about the transformation of sports, technology, and entertainment. So it's with great pleasure that we bring on Scott Kaplan. Scott, welcome to the show. We are so excited to have you. Wow. I mean, you guys have just made me sound so much bigger and better and cooler than I think of myself as being. <laughs> so thank you. Here's what I say. Claim it. Own it. It's yours. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do that. I, I need to do better at doing that. You're exactly right, Cher. Exactly. And so tell us about your 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 radio show, as Howard mentioned, is morphed into a podcast and then eventually evolved into this nightly TV show. Yeah. And it's literally changing the way sports programs are being sports talk programs are being heard and viewed, of course. So talk to us a little bit about this, this evolution of how we consume your type of programming. What's that? Been like. You know, it's actually, I'm glad you asked it that way because um, that's exactly what my mind was thinking several years ago. I was in um, a, a park with my daughter who was playing in a soccer tournament and there were hundreds of teams. So then there were thousands of kids and not only were there all these kids, but there were all these parents. So there were thousands of people in this park and I looked around and everybody had their phone and, and they were they were listening to their uh, phones or they were playing on their phones. And I remember being a kid and we used to have a Walkman that we used to put on our arm or a, a, a thing we would carry around with a cassette tape and we would have earphones and nobody has anything like that anymore. And I realized not that it should I should have known this really, but everybody has this. Everybody has a, a, a huge piece of media in their hands at all times. And I thought not one person out here has a transistor radio. Not one person out here has an old school Walkman where they could listen to AM or FM radio, not one. And the only way that any of these folks could listen to radio is by using their phone and by using an app. And I thought to myself, what am I doing being exclusively on radio? I'm expecting mm. people to get into their cars, turn on the channel, find me and that's where they're going to get my content and it, it was like an aha moment for me when i said i need to have all of my content available to everybody and everybody has a phone and with that i said we've got to just we can't just be on radio anymore we need to go to the people not expect the people to come to us mm. and that that was really a, a big moment for me several years ago that has led me uh, you know, I, I, at that point, I was planting a seed and it has it has grown and it's turned into all these different platforms now. And it's interesting because this is literally TV on your own terms. This is your show on your terms, the way that you're doing it because of of the way that you've been pioneering in this space. And I think that's remarkable in itself. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I used to think again when I was a little kid, if I'm going to get on TV, I got to go get a job with a television mm -hmm. station or I've got to go hopefully get a job with ESPN or a big television network. And the fact of the matter is um, you could be on your television, but you might be on YouTube. It's just that you have a smart TV now 
or in the case of what I'm doing, um, I've added cable television. So I've gone out, I found a partner, they needed content, I provide content. Guess what? It's peanut butter and chocolate. All of a sudden you put it together and you got mm. something really good. So Scott, you intentionally democratized basically access to you, the viewer's access to you across every platform known to man. That's what Alex <laughs> Padilla talks about all the time. That was done intentionally right before uh, COVID or was that done as you know, 1090, you were morphing 1090 into something else? Can you take us, when was the aha moment? What was the date? So um, I wish that how I wish I, I was smart enough to have seen into the future, but really much of this was built out of desperation, if I'm being completely mm -hmm. candid. So here's what happened uh, about two plus years ago. So March, April of 2019, a radio station that I had been broadcasting on for the better part of 16 years had been incredibly successful. And I don't mean me. I mean, the station had been incredibly successful. Ratings, we had them. Sales, we had them. Um, things were really, really going great. But through some mismanagement, um, things got really messed up. And I mean, behind the scenes. Um, mm -hmm. So the on air was, was fine. And it looked and sounded like the sales were fine. But I didn't know it at the time how screwed up the business actually was. So in 2019, literally from out of nowhere, this incredibly successful radio station went off the air, completely off the air. So um, I, I didn't know what to do. I really did not know what to do. I, I honestly was arrogant enough to think, well, some other radio station in town is going to immediately hire me. I've got the ratings. I've got the longevity. I've got the notoriety. I'm, I'm easily going to get another job in a matter of seconds. Well, that didn't happen. And it didn't happen because radio was going through a whole bunch of changes itself. Um, and, and this is pre COVID. So I was really, really lucky because Howard, you'll know these guys, but, um, because of your work, uh, in the golf industry, um, in San Diego, but, um, Callaway golf, had built an ESPN style uh, facility, broadcast facility. And these friends of mine at Callaway Golf said, now that you're not on the radio anymore, why don't you come up here and use our studio and broadcast from here? And I said, broadcast to who? On what? I don't have a radio station anymore. And they literally said to me, you don't need a radio station in 2019. I said, well, where am I going to broadcast? They said, we'll put you on YouTube and we'll be able to use other software that can put you out on podcast platforms. And so your audience will follow you. Of course, I had no idea that what they said was going to be true. So I went to Callaway Golf, which is in Carlsbad, California, and I used their studio and I they turned on their cameras and out we went to YouTube where we had zero subscribers. We, we never used YouTube. And that was another one of those moments where I said, I actually don't need the radio anymore. I've got a loyal audience. I've got loyal uh, sponsors. I've got a team of people and we're doing the same thing. We're just doing it on a different platform. And that was the beginning of where I am today, which is two years later, which back then, remember, went from radio, yeah. off radio onto YouTube. And now I, I went to a, a broadcaster convention in Dallas a couple of years ago and there was a, a gentleman I saw he had a banner advertising his, his network and he had radio, television, YouTube, Alexa, um, Apple podcast and all these other platforms. And I went, that's what I need to do. I need to be in the car when people get in the car on radio, when they're at home at night and they're flipping channels, I need to be on TV. I need to be on YouTube for a, a younger audience. And I need to be on every audio podcast platform that I can find because people are using so many different ones. So, that was really the beginning. The beginning was getting kicked off of radio, unbeknownst to me. So, Scott, let's spend a minute on Callaway because we both have a long history, long successful history with Callaway. Their benevolence, their partnership really can't be understated. Uh, Chip Brewer is a friend and a mentor. Chip is a, a CEO of Callaway. Before that, the interim CEO was Tony Thornley, who was my old CFO at Qualcomm. And before that, there was obviously uh, Ely and uh, Dick Helmsetter. Uh, my father went to Callaway 27 years ago with this sketch outline of, I want to build a 501c3 um, golf program 
that becomes an academy, a learning academy for kids in the inner city. My father, who had never heard the word no in his life, walked in and sitting there is Richard Helmstetter and Ely Calloway. He gives them the 15 minute pitch and there's a little bit of silence. And Ely Calloway says, no, Ernie, I'm not gonna give you $50,000. What I'm gonna do is give you $500,000 if you can find matching $500,000 so this program can be sustainable. 26 years later, millions of dollars given away in um, uh, scholarships to kids, tens of thousands of kids that have come through the program. There's a debt of gratitude that the Wright family and pro kids owes to Callaway that we will never be able to repay. But I love the fact that they are really institutional in their, their, their regional focus in San Diego County and uh, helping partners like us and helping partners like you. Yeah, I, I'm how I know the story of your dad. Uh, I know what Pro Kids has meant to San Diego. Um, I know about its expansion. I've been lucky enough, obviously, to be close to it. But to your point about Callaway Golf, the company, through different iterations and different CEOs, yeah. Um, and the course of 25 years, just lucky for me um, and so many kids in, in San Diego that have been part of those scholarships, lucky that a company like that was here. Um, because really, the way I met these guys was they were radio listeners and they called me and said, hey, would you come up here and visit with us? We have an idea. I said, OK. I went up to visit with them and all they wanted to do was just be part of anything philanthropic that I was involved with in San Diego. They're like, hey, we hear you on the radio. You're, you're at a lot of golf tournaments. You're sponsoring or you're you're, you're visiting with uh, different events, mostly surrounding golf. Wherever you go in golf, we want to go in golf. And, and I went, oh, my God, that's the greatest gift ever. Because anytime I was invited to go be in a golf tournament, um, I could always bring with me, hey, here's a set of Callaway clubs to auction off, or mm -hmm. hey, here's um Callaway golf balls to give away to to make your event more attractive. Or I, I was the conduit between Callaway and the philanthropic community of of San Diego. And so I, I didn't know at the time, of course. Uh, I just thought, hey, this is kind of cool. I've got some access to some golf equipment for myself. Um, <laughs> and, and, and i've and I'm able to, you know, spread the love through the philanthropic community, but little did I know that Callaway Golf would be instrumental in helping save my career, seriously. Mm -hmm. And Sherry, this is really where uh, Kaplan and crew, they're hyper-focused on San Diego. So now I'm a displaced San Diegan. I'm an ex <laughs> and I can watch or listen to um, the, the podcast from Kaplan, usually late at night before I'm going to sleep, mm -hmm. uh, early in the morning trying to get a workout or a Peloton in myself and feel connected to San Diego and Southern California. But the show is much more than that. The show talks about national and international issues, not afraid to delve into race, homophobia, xenophobia, uh, you know, Islamophobia. It is a wonderful, uh, uh, it takes me away <laughs> for right. 90 minutes or two hours a day. And that's different than some of the other shows. Some of the other shows, Scotty, are way too preachy. They're way too opinionated. You have this wonderful balance between you, uh, Alex Padilla, and John Browner. And was that intentional? Because you used to work with BR for a long time. How did you get that, you know, those three amigos together? Again, kind of kind of lucky. Um, Cher, my, I had a radio partner for 18 years who was a former Charger linebacker, and he was an angel of a guy. He really, <laughs> and he still is an angel of a guy. It's just that, unfortunately, as he aged a bit, um, he uh, dealt with and is dealing with many of the same issues that other former NFL players were dealing with. I mean, when you were a star player as a kid and then a high school superstar and a college All-American and an NFL first-round draft choice, you know, that 20-plus years of hitting your head in practice every day, right? It, it took its toll. It really did. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we made that transition from radio, when we got – when we our radio station went belly up, when we went up to Callaway Golf, it really just came down to who still wanted to do this. Now, um, everybody had kind of a severance package from the radio station, and everybody felt like we, we still owed it to the audience to bring it to them every day. And really what happened ultimately was – um, all that was really left was me, my longtime producer, this young man, Alex Padilla, 
Um, and then we had this, this other young guy named John Browner who had worked in our promotions department and he just kept showing up every day. Right. And I had, I had been cultivating his talent because he was a super funny guy and really opinionated. And I had been putting him on the radio, but ultimately there were just the three of us were, were still standing. My, mm -hmm. my other co-hosts both went into, you know, kind of retirement. I had a female co-host named Linda Welby, or it was time for her to really put more energy into her children who were graduating high school and so on. And, and my other partner, Billy Ray, he was going to go into retirement. And we were the last three guys standing and they, they wanted to do it and they were getting their roles elevated. So they saw an opportunity. And um, little did I know at the time that you would have a 50 year old white guy mm -hmm. with a 30 year old Mexican kid and a 35 year old young African American guy who has a whole other world of experiences. And the three of us came together. Well, it, nobody ever thought about the makeup of the show until things started to happen in the world, you know, and, and until George Floyd and, and COVID and the world started to, to shift on a different axis. And we all looked at each other and said, We've got ourselves a really nice United Nations of, yeah. of different sorts of backgrounds here. And everybody is available and willing to tackle tough subject matter. And, you know, for me, Howard, you, you can probably appreciate this very, very well. Um, but as a team sport athlete, particularly yeah. in college, you know, I was a white kid from suburban Fort Lauderdale, Florida, who mm -hmm. shows up in a college locker room of 110 guys. And many of those guys were from inner city Detroit or um, you know, inner city LA. And uh, they, what, what they brought to the locker room was very different than what I had experienced up until that point. Right. But they taught me for five years about their experiences. And I shared with them my experiences. And we both walked out of that relationship out of a college football locker room in Pittsburgh. We all walked out better people for it um, and still have those brotherhood type relationships today because that's the thing is, is that um, I've always thought that team sports and and locker rooms that's how you learn to deal with other people and other mm -hmm. backgrounds and you have, yeah yeah almost any time now we can turn off uh twitter we can turn off uh, facebook and we can just ignore a dissenting opinion or a dissenting argument with uh you know credible facts in those locker rooms scotty on those buses on those long trips you know who your teammates are and you accept them and love them for their strengths and their weaknesses, but you are forced to hear a different valuable uh, opinion that otherwise you probably wouldn't uh, have ever. So we talked, we're here in San Diego right now, but we skipped over kind of one of my favorite parts now. This start in Pittsburgh, as you know, our company C360 is based in Pittsburgh. I go there probably once a month for business and love the, Allegheny County, the tech hub that Pittsburgh is now versus yeah. the time in the early 90s <laughs> when you went to school, Scotty. Talk to us about that dichotomy. Right now, the years, Facebook and Google and Amazon are putting huge hubs. The talent that comes out of Pitt, in New Penn State, you know, even uh, Penn all the way in, uh, in Philadelphia. Did you see this or did you feel that, um, I don't know, uh, expertise that was in Pittsburgh that many years ago? I can't say that I did. I really can't. Um, I loved Pittsburgh. I mean, when I went there, I was, I was 17 years old, fresh out of high school. And I just loved the fact that I was in a big city. Um, and, and what I thought was a big city, you know, cause it had really nice skyscrapers and really nice rivers and cool bridges. And I just thought it was big time. And part of that is also sports. You know, you had the Steelers and the Pirates and the Penguins, and, and these teams were all competing for championships. Um, maybe not so much the Pirates. Well, actually, at the time, the Pirates had Barry Bonds and Bobby Bonilla, and Sid Bream. I mean, they, they were actually right there seemingly every year. Mario Lemieux was the star of the Penguins. Yaramir Yager was mm -hmm. an up-and-coming star. And, and the Steelers had, you know, so many superstars um, especially on the defensive side. So I just thought of Pittsburgh as being big time. Um, but I also at the time thought of it as being steel mill kind of city. Right. And there, were, there was a Tom Cruise movie called All the Right Moves. And it yeah. was about this town in suburban Pittsburgh. Um, they called it Ambridge in the movie, but um, it, is, um, it was actually called Ampipe in the movie, but it's Ambridge is the real name of the town. And so I thought of Pittsburgh in that way. 
Um, in, and playing college football at Pitt, I thought about Tony Dorsett and Dan Marino and Hugh Green, and I thought about all the stars that had come before me at Pitt. Um, what I didn't know in the late 80s and early 90s is, is that Pittsburgh was actually going through a really interesting transformation. It was going from this steel mill city to, at the time, what was becoming more about um, education and medicine. So um, you mentioned Pitt and Carnegie Mellon and some of these other schools in Pittsburgh. Um, how, but uh, Penn State was also, you know, even though it was a few hours away, Pittsburgh uh, was a big part of of that school too. I mean, people, a lot of talent would come to Pittsburgh. When I go back into Pittsburgh now, um, I would tell people all the time, yeah, Pittsburgh transitioned to more education and more medicine because of of how big UPMC has become. But really now, when I go back, I'm blown away to mention the companies you just mentioned are hubs uh, or right. have brought a ton of talent to Pittsburgh. And, you know, you think about how many people maybe were in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley and how expensive life was and housing and every last thing. And Pittsburgh became a much more attractive um, alternative. Uh, and, and I think when people get to Pittsburgh now, especially right now, people are like, wow. I had no idea. I knew what my perception of Pittsburgh was. I didn't know what it's become. And it, again, so many young, talented people are descending upon that city and working in the tech business. And the DC community is flourishing there with, you know, really deep pocketed tech funds. Um, Blue Tree Capital is an investor in us. Catherine Mott is their you know, managing director and an investor and a, um, you know, a mentor of mine. Really, I hadn't been there, Scott, in 15, 16 years. And when I got there, you know, staying at that Marriott right by the Roberto Clemente Bridge, uh, you feel this new energy. It's very similar to Austin 10 years ago. It's very mm -hmm. similar to Tel Aviv 15, 20 years ago. Um, we're excited to be there. Now, I love that excitement. Wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. Because it's like, we're talking tech hub. We're talking this new tech hub. And you put your hat in the tech ring with Sided.co. Yeah. Tell us well, a little bit about that. Because everything seems to be like this, not quite accidental innovation. It's like you're just, your experience, you're seeing a need and you're like, oh my gosh, this is something that we can create. So again, in this new this new space, Sided.co, tell us, tell us about the platform. How does it work and what led you to start it? Well, thank you for that. I am really very happy to share this um, with everybody. Um, so just by the way, you mentioned how Pittsburgh has become a place for VCs, especially in tech. And and our company cited its roots are in Pittsburgh. There's, um, there's a young man in Pittsburgh, his name is Zach Snyder. And Zach's grandfather is a gentleman by the name of Corky Cost. And Corky Cost, if you were to go onto the Pitt campus, the baseball stadium has his name on it. The indoor facility that football or tennis uses has his name on it. He's been a very generous donor to the University of Pittsburgh. And he's one of the biggest builders in the Midwest, built Heinz Field um, and, and a lot of other buildings that you would see in downtown Pittsburgh. Well, the grandson, Zach Snyder, he wanted to uh, prove to all of his friends that he knew more about the Pittsburgh Penguins than they did and that he had stronger opinions than they did. But the problem for him was every time he went on Twitter, they could argue, but there was no scoreboard and there was no mm -hmm. finality to the conversation. So to make a long story, a very long story, somewhat short, the gentleman who runs the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center Cancer Treatment Center, his name is Dr. Stanley Marks. Dr. Marks was my mentor when I was at Pitt and has been a father figure to me for the last 30 years. Dr. Marks called me and said, hey, this young man, I know him, I know his family, they know me, they want me to invest in this company. And frankly, I don't know anything about it. It's a sports media related company, would you look at it? So I did, and I then said to him, listen, I think this is a great idea and I'm gonna help. So he invested some, some, some money into the company. When I brought um, this company to a group of angel investors here in San Diego, they actually said to me, this is your area of expertise, why don't you take over the company? I was like, mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, if, I mean, I'm a talk radio show guy and they're like, yeah, 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 but you're the one who's trying to raise the money and you're the one who has all the connections. Why don't you take it over? So I literally took this company over four years ago and um, its roots are very, very much in Pittsburgh, um, mm -hmm. but we're running it out of San Diego. But I'll just tell you very briefly what this company does, uh, because originally what we thought we were going to do was we thought talk radio personalities would adopt this platform 
and they would drive their audience to this platform cited because there they would be able to have a better opportunity to monetize the engagement that they create, which is something that personalities in radio in particular cannot use Twitter for. Right. However, as, as you guys can appreciate, you know, you go through these different iterations when you're a startup and you're trying to find true product market fit. What we have found all these years later um, is that what we really do is we solve a huge problem for sports publishers. And it doesn't have to just be sports, but we're really leaned in on sports because of my background and because of mm -hmm. my relationships. And what, what's happening is sports publishers have lost a lot of access to data through Google and Apple and their privacy controls. They have, uh, they have lost a lot of access to data. So what our tool does is it sits on your website or on your app and it sits within the content. So if you're reading an article about are the Pittsburgh Steelers going to win the Super Bowl this year, you may never get down to the bottom of the comment section. Our tool actually embeds inside of the article. It prompts you with a question. Do you think the Steelers will win the Super Bowl this year? Now you vote. And once you vote and you see the score, this is the main key. When you click on an embedded tweet, you leave that website and you go to Twitter and you may never come back. What happens with Cited is you click to vote. You see the score and then a side panel opens up on the website. So a gamified social experience happens on your website. And the reason that's so important mm. is because it keeps people on the site longer, on average, 28 percent longer. It also creates multiple ad impression opportunities for the publisher. And then finally, it collects first party data. So you really get an idea of who is your audience? How do I reach them by email? How do I get their phone number? Um, let me understand their sentiment. Uh, around certain topics. And all of that happens on your site. You don't mm -hmm. even go to somebody else's site. So it's taken a long time, if I'm being honest. It's taken many different iterations. Um, but our company's roots are very, very Pittsburgh centric. And I'll tell you guys, um, I use that Pittsburgh thing all the time. Um, even most recently, you know, I've been, <laughs> I've been pitching Mark Cuban, and, yeah. and Mark Cuban has been unbelievably engaged in what we're doing. And, and it really is our Pittsburgh connection that has created that relationship. Mm -hmm. So let's stay in Pittsburgh for a second. Go back to football. Those of football course. Teams, you know, <laughs> the, the pit football teams. Now you're talking about the Steelers. The teams and the coaches that you had in those late 80s teams and early 90s, it is – you know, you and I've had this discussion. How do you guys not go undefeated for one or two seasons with all that talent that came through there during those days, you, yourself included? Yeah, well, you know, it's it's really interesting. And uh, I was I was a freshman at Pitt in 1988, and we had one of the top recruiting classes in the country. And the year before, they had one of the top recruiting classes in the country. And I'm telling you, we were littered with first round draft choices and names that you would know from the NFL. Uh, you know, when I got to Pitt just my freshman year, we had a, a guy named Tom Ricketts, who was a first round draft choice of the Steelers, an offensive lineman, a guy named Mark Stepnoski, who for years was Troy Aikman's center with the Dallas Cowboys, uh, Tony Saragusa, who became a Super Bowl champion with the Baltimore Ravens, Burt Grossman, who was a first round draft choice of the San Diego Chargers back then. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the list goes on and on. And as my years progressed at Pitt, we had John Gruden as an assistant coach as a young man. Mike McCarthy, the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys, was an up-and-coming assistant coach at the time. Marvin Lewis, who was the former coach of the Cincinnati Bengals, was one of our assistant coaches. Uh, Paul Hackett was our head coach, and he went to USC. Even before that, Mike Gottfried was our head coach. We had so many name brand head coaches, assistant coaches who became NFL head coaches and players. Um, Alex Van Pelt was my roommate. He's the offensive coordinator of the Cleveland Browns. Curtis Martin was a local kid from, from yeah. Pittsburgh who became a Hall of Famer. And Sean Gilbert was the number one high school football player in the country, USA Today Player of the Year, who came to Pitt and was the number two overall pick in the NFL draft. And I, I'm just this is off the top of my head, but the list goes on and on and on of great coaches and great players and great talents. And it, it still to this day bothers us all like any other athlete in any sport. It still bothers us to this day. Like how did we have so much coaching talent and yeah. playing talent and not have the wins to show for it? Mm -hmm. That's good. And then your career, then you come out, you try out for the, the Chargers and then you, you stay all these years later. 
talk us through your athletic prowess and career. <laughs> well, I had a I had a great experience at Pitt. I really did. And um, I, I got to start at Pitt for three years. Unfortunately, my senior year, I, I got sick in training camp. It, I, di I didn't really recover. And, you know, the season had gotten away from us and somebody else had replaced me and was doing a great job. So after my senior year at Pitt, I still really wanted to play in the NFL. And um, I bounced around the NFL for three seasons. I was with the San Diego Chargers. I was with the Detroit Lions. I was with the Chicago Bears. I signed to play in the World League of American Football back then. It was called NFL Europe. And um, I kind of gave myself a period of time that I'm going to try and play pro ball. So I, I'd gotten some great experiences by being in NFL training camps. And then I said, you know what? I really always wanted to be in the media business. So I came back to Pittsburgh. And the first job I had was at WPXI Television, which is the TV station on the north side that sits up at the very top of the hill. And I was there working on a TV show called Steelers 94. And that was my entry level into sports media, $5 an hour. I could only, I could only work 20 hours a week. Of course, I worked like 80 hours a week. Um, and I just did anything I could do to get my hands on sports media. I would go to the Steelers and do interviews. I would come back and work on editing. I would, I would try and learn how to do um, uh, camera work. I mean, anything I could do to get into the sports media business. And there was a gentleman who used to work at WPXI. Gosh, I wish I remembered his name. But he once told me, if you want to be in this business, you will not survive. But if it's something you need in your life, if you need it, you will be successful. And I, that, that has always registered with me that it, it's a need. If you need it, you'll get it. If you want it, eh, you may or you may not. Interesting. And so in those 20 plus years of being literally on the field into these uh, broadcast booths, um, the technology evolutions that you've seen from sky cam to you know, line to gain marker, um, first down strike, the pitch strike zone uh, in, in baseball. What are some of the things that us as 50 year old guys would have never envisioned that are actually reality now? You know, it, it's interesting you bring that up, Howard, because when I'm on the sideline of an NFL broadcast, um, more often than not, I'm doing national radio yeah. and, mm -hmm. and radio is a whole different animal than than television. But what's interesting about it is, is I wind up working with my colleagues from television on the field. And one of the most fascinating things, and particularly that fans will never see, is if you watch a football game and you see Michelle Tafoya on the sideline of an NBC game on Sunday night, or if you see Lisa Salters as a sideline reporter on ESPN on Monday Night Football, you think to yourself, how are these folks able to get the information or really more than anything, the right. visuals of what's happening? Because I can stand on the sideline and look at the game, or I could stand in the end zone and look at the game. And as a former player, have a good idea of what it is that I'm seeing and what I want to report and the things that I want to share with the audience that as radio listeners, they're not able to, to see. But mm -hmm. from a television standpoint, the use of, of iPads in particular, or any sort of tablet for that matter, to be on the field, they actually have them on sticks so that we can walk around and see everything that's going on, all the different camera angles. You mentioned a sky cam. I mean, everything that's going on on the field that I need access to, that I would never normally have had access to, right. that I do now because of the technological advances, not just the different camera angles, but the different ways. You remember in the old days, there might be some <laughs> giant box TV sitting on the sideline. And, and we know, liked it that way. <laughs> oh, right. It was big and it was heavy and it didn't move. Now things are just this big. They're tiny, they're small and they're, and they're mobile. And it, it gives somebody like myself access to information that I wouldn't have had that I can then pass on to the audience. So, Scott, we've been talking on this show about the immersive media economy and the premise or the, you know, the supposition really is, is that now the cloud has gotten closer to the field. The cameras, including our cameras from C360, have gotten closer to the field of play, to the ice, to the pitch, to the diamond, uh, you know, to the football field. There is latency that is sub 200 milliseconds that's going exactly from you know the field that you're standing on to my device or to my 60 inch tv what do you think in the next three to five years 
you and I have been able, luckiest guys ever. We've been to every event that we've ever wanted to go on to go to. We've been backstage. We've been green roomed at all these events. What do you think happens in the next three to five years in terms of taking a local kid from San Diego or Shanghai and transporting them literally onto the field or onto the ice? What do you think happens? Wow, that is a really, really great question. And, and you know, it's got me thinking about just the other night I was watching the Major League Baseball All-Star game. And I wasn't watching it because it was particularly interesting as a game itself. But what I was really interested in was the technology. Can you imagine that a broadcaster can be in a booth and a player could be at bat and the player can wear an earpiece and be, and be <laughs> mic'd and can be and can talk to the broadcaster during the actual game telecast. And I thought, now that is so cool. And I get it. It's a it's a an all star exhibition and it's really a television show. But man, the access to um, technology and then the combination of technology with the game itself and then this desire from the audience to want more to to, to want more access to it um, i would think that in the next five years uh, we are going to have access like never before one mm -hmm. of the things that i know many of us really love is nfl films NFL Films is on every sideline. They've got boom microphones that's, that are over the coach. And you hear things that are said weeks later, uh, or maybe it's just days later, but things that if you're just watching on television, you would never hear. And truthfully, even if I'm on the sideline, I can't hear a lot of this exactly. stuff. But, but NFL Films grants us this access that we haven't had. And I think how that, that the access to what we all want is kind of the next big thing that we're going to get. And whether it's because of the technology of the cameras um, that you're talking about, or it's just maybe leagues loosening up um, because they understand that it's still just entertainment and you, you want to keep um, you want to keep progressing for the audience to give them something new and fresh. I personally think, because it's a great question, that the access to the behind the scenes and in game is kind of the next big thing. At least I think it is. Yeah, we're in, we're in violent agreement on that, and we have uh, nothing that we're ready to announce uh, today, but <laughs> a couple uh, pretty deep level conversations going on with, with broadcasters and several leagues to basically galvanize that, to weaponize that in the not too distant future. So more on that uh, later. <clears throat> on, on that, I, I remember my father, um, who was a charger, and then after he was a charger, we take us down on the field from time to time. Bo Jackson and the Raiders came to town, and I was on the sideline as a young kid, maybe a teenager, and they had a you know sweep right for Bo Jackson, and now here are 22 of the largest human beings that I've ever seen <laughs> wanting to converge on Bo Jackson at the same time. Scotty, he hit that hole, and what up the right sidelines at old Jack Murphy now Qualcomm Stadium now you know it's it's a Why? it's a it flattened. I could tell that story at a wine and cheese part, a party and explain to folks what I smelled, what I heard, what I saw. Now we're going to have the ability to actually draw, you know, bring up on your phone. Here's the highlight. For, here's the auto ISO. Here's the view from the, um, from the player. Here's the view from the coach. Here's the view from the sky cam. I think that is going to revolutionize the game and the leagues are incented to monetize that in rev share with partners like us and cited and, and everyone else along the way. See, I think that is so cool, you know, to, to be able to have that memory, yeah. to be able to share it, but then to be able to say, Hey, let's take a look at it together, you know, mm -hmm. right. Because, because how many times might you be at that same party and say, oh, hey, here's my kids, or hey, here I was last week, or hey, take a look at this. And you can show somebody something that, that you've done, but to have access to um, things in your memory, uh, certain plays, certain places, uh, and to want to be able to share that and show it, I, I think that is really cool. How I, I got to just ask you, I mean, your experience, because uh, you've gone through so many different, you know, you've been through some really big tech companies, yeah. you know, and you've been around a lot of technology. 
I mean, how much of that in your past is is so much a part of your of your present and your future? No, it is all of these uh, experiences have prepared me for the moment that we are at right now. It is, I thoroughly loved my time at Qualcomm. You know the Jacobs family as well as I do. Uh, Paul uh, came on the show as well, Scotty. Um, you know, authentic leadership, you know, great humans. And then you also recognize fantastic, world-changing technology. Mm -hmm. so basically my time at Qualcomm prepared me for the moments. Intel taught me more about you know cloud x86 and the integrated circuitry that it that is takes for all of these networks to be built, and that's one of the reasons when I got a chance to talk to the board at C360 and they were recruiting me, I mentally joined about 11 minutes into our 90 minute uh, Zoom, <laughs> simply because defensible IP, world class um, engineering talent and a board. And as we jump into this trillion dollar ecosystem, which is the immersive uh, media economy, there's so much money to be made with and for the leagues and broadcasters. Why wouldn't you take this swing with Sighted? Why wouldn't you take this opportunity with C360? That's why we're probably, you know, uh, kindred spirits, even though we don't get to see each other uh, nearly as much as we did when I lived in San Diego. So the interesting yeah. thing is, as, as you look at this conversation, it's all been about evolution. You look at the evolution of your career, the evolution of what you're creating digitally, the evolution of growing your, your platform, the evolution of Pittsburgh, the evolution of broadcasting, everything that's going on at C360 as far as the technology. Um, that gives you a lot of learned experience. And I know one of the things that Howard has a very famous question that he asks each and every one of our guests. And I, I look forward to this insight that you're going to share with us because um, just because you've lived in so many different lanes of evolution. And so, but with that comes challenges and opportunities. So Howard, I'll let you go into your question so that you can you can ask it in the only in the way that only you can. <laughs> so, Scotty, this wasn't in your prepared material. So here we go. Nope. Um, what was your best day of your life professionally, and what was the worst day of your life professionally? Why, and what did you learn um, out of both of those events? Well, I'll start with my worst day professionally. Um, a few years ago, 2012, I um, I said something on the air that was intended to be a throwaway comment. Okay. I mean, it was, it was six o'clock in the morning, you know, it, it, it literally was just intended to be a, a, an, a, it was an attempt at comedy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and along the way I said something that was insulting to the person I was talking about, who was a television broadcaster. And again, I mean, truthfully, as a talk radio show host, you're, you're dancing naked on the stage for everybody to see at all times because you're, you're out there with no net is what I'm saying, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and when you're on the radio live every day and you do 20 hours of live radio a week, um, you're bound to say things that don't sit well with people and, and they're not necessarily intentionally mean spirited. Well, I said one thing, um, I, I, I said something about a woman and her appearance. She was a very tall lady. She was sitting next to two very short guys. And I was making fun of what it looked like on television. And really what it was about was about how the basketball team at San Diego State wasn't getting big time television coverage. It was getting small time, low definition television coverage. And I was making this whole point about how bad it all looked. And you know what? I was trying to be a goofball and a funny guy. And, you know, it just didn't turn out so well. And, and truth be told, one person was very, very offended. And this one person went on a crusade to get me fired and mm -hmm. and he did he got me fired and it was um it was really and by the way it wasn't my first time being fired it's right. just that it's just that the, the reason this was my worst day is because the way it was being framed for the public was he said this terribly insulting thing and and the, the gentleman who fired me he actually was a smart guy he was trying to really destroy me um, and the reason was, is because it was a financial thing. It, it wasn't about what I said. It was about money. Yeah. And, and so, um, 
the way they framed it for the public was he said this terrible thing about a female who's a former Olympic champion. So like they turned her into something. Oh, how dare he say this about someone who repped mm. the U.S. and won a goal. It just got out of control, totally out of control. And I felt terrible about it because I didn't mean to be insulting. I was trying to be funny. Um, but not only that, you know, I have three daughters. And so now, you know, it's on the news. Like, like locally, it's on the television news. Fat mouth over here gets himself fired because he said something about this woman. And, and that it wasn't really the truth. Um, mm -hmm. But I did say what I said. Um, and now I got to go home. You know, and I've got to face my children and I've got to face my wife at the time and I've got to come up with what am I going to do next? And is my reputation going to be destroyed? And am I am I completely unhirable? Am I toxic? All these sorts mm -hmm. of things. But I'll tell you that in that worst day, you know, in that worst day of of being humiliated, being fired, um, uh, you know, all the things that, that come with that sort of moment in your life. You know, the, the, you flip that whole thing. And, and I remember this television reporter came to my house to do an interview with me. And she said, she said this to me, she said, well, what are you going to tell your children? Like this very judgmental mm -hmm. tone, you know, like, what are you going to tell your children? And I said to this, this person, I said, I'm going to tell my children, look at dad now. He's down. Okay. He, he's on the mat, but yeah. watch him get up and watch him come out swinging. And, and, and that was really my message. And, and so the worst day was being fired, being humiliated, um, uh, knowing that someone was trying to really ruin me. Um, and then the best day was about eight months later, after I had won my lawsuit against the radio station uh, in front of a female judge that they chose because the judge was about the letter of the law, not about what Loudmouth said on the radio. And mm -hmm. uh, and I won that lawsuit and the CEO who made a unilateral decision at the time got fired by the parent company. His uh, puppet general manager that he had put in got fired <laughs> by the company and they put me back on the air. And it was a it was a, it was a great celebration for like me. MacArthur. It was like MacArthur, a triumphant return. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was it. I, it was a, it was a, and it was one of the greatest days of my career to to say, right. hey, look, you know, I, I know what happened. I know what was said. I know how it was reported, et cetera, et cetera. And for that, I was terribly sorry. But I, I loved my audience. Um, I loved my city, okay. you know, um, and I really wanted to get back. And, and getting back was one of the greatest days. So let's continue in that, which is now post Stephen A. Smith's comment. I thought you had some insightful things to say on Kaplan and crew for folks who are not watching or downloading. You should please do so. And then even Rachel uh, Nichols. Uh, these are colleagues of yours, those co-workers of yours at ESPN. And you can give them grace, but also call them on things that where they have made a mistake and ask them to be better in this uh, cancel culture world that we now live in how do you try to strike that balance because you said you're on the on you know open mic 20 hours a week you're bound to say something that causes harm to someone mm -hmm. you've had a couple different times we've talked about the Emmett Teal legacy we talked about Juneteenth Juneteenth you've never shied away from being an ally for those that don't have uh, the same sex as you or don't have the same hue as you, mm -hmm. you think about Rachel uh, and Stephen A. Smith. You know, Rachel Nichols to me, um, I think that her, I think here's what happens. I think you get to a big platform like ESPN, you start to make a lot of money, you have a lot of fame. And the next thing you know, you think you own something. And the fact is you don't own it. Okay. I mean, Howard, look, you're the CEO of your company, but you are replaceable. You know, mm -hmm. as much as you may not think so, but but you are a replaceable guy. Just like when you were playing basketball at Stanford, if you weren't getting the job done, you were replaceable. When you're mm -hmm. with the Orlando Magic, if you're not good enough, they'll find somebody else who can do the job better. And that's what we learn from sports is that everybody is replaceable. I remember Tony Romo years ago when he lost his job to Dak Prescott. He said football is a meritocracy. It's yeah. true. You know, it, it in sports, you learn, you perform or you get replaced. In Rachel Nichols' case, look, she thought that something that was in her contract therefore belonged to her. She never really considered that the bosses up above 
may make a decision that may your contract says one thing, we're going to pay you what your contract says, but we're going to change your role. And we, the bosses have that right. And for mm -hmm. whatever reason they made the decision and whether you agree with it or you don't, it is their decision to make because you're the employee and they're the ones running the company and even they are replaceable. And I think Rachel Nichols lost sight of replaceability. Um, and then to, to, to say the things that she said in the venue that she said them, in my opinion, was very unprofessional. Um, I understand people have conversations behind closed doors, but man, I'm telling you right now, even here in my studio, I'm always very conscious of could it's my beyond. cameras be on, <laughs> you know, could my microphones be on. And I'm very conscious of that. And she clearly was not, you know, and as for Stephen A. Smith, I love Stephen A. I love his, how, mm -hmm. how outrageous he is and how fearless he is. But you know, the thing is about, you know, when you say something about how a player can't be the face of a sport because he needs an interpreter. And in this country that doesn't work. Here's what That's I would okay. say. You know what, though? It, it's an old take. 20 years ago, if you said to me, why is the NHL not a popular sport? And, and my opinion may have been back then, hey, look, it's all these guys from the Eastern Bloc of Europe. They come to America. You don't know how to say their last names and they don't speak English. That's a take from 1995. Mm -hmm. You know, in 2021, as the earth has gotten smaller, particularly because of social media and the ability to communicate with anybody worldwide on all of these different platforms, I think people like to celebrate the differences. I yeah. like that Otani is from Japan. I know that he is capable of speaking English, but I also like the fact that he wants to speak his own language because guess what? He represents Japan. And mm -hmm. it, it, I don't know how to say it in Japanese, but it's about keeping it real. Let your yeah. people know in Japan, I speak your language. I'm, I'm representing you here in Major League Baseball. And you know what's super interesting is after all of this Otani controversy, what happened last night? Um, the guy who wins the uh, Major League Baseball All-Star MVP, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., speaks through an interpreter yeah. in the post-game interview. You yeah. know, and I, and I just think this, that young people in particular, young sports fans who all of a sudden watch Premier League soccer when I didn't grow up watching European soccer. But you know how many young sports fans know Premier League soccer or mm -hmm. watch the European championships? We love the international now. We love the differences or people from other parts of the world. And I think yeah. having a take about using an interpreter and a lack of marketability is an old take. And the thing I reminded everybody of is the number one player in baseball over the last five years is a white guy from New Jersey who speaks perfect English, only you never hear him talk because he doesn't <laughs> want to be in front of a camera. And that's Mike Trout, so. Yeah. And you look at your, you look at your show, you look at the diversity. We talked about it earlier on in the show and just the crew that you guys are and it one holds you accountable, but it also gives you that permission space to have these real conversations where you're bringing up these perspectives and um, appreciating diversity for what it is. And, and that, you know, in this culture is a must I in order to have realize. really authentic conversations. And, and that's just it, is, is having those authentic conversations, as Howard and I have had talks many times on and off air, that's mm -hmm. how we make progress. Right. You got to communicate with people. So, Scotty, let's bring it back to our beloved Padres. When I say our beloved Padres, I go way back uh, even uh, longer than you. <laughs> so, born and raised in San Diego. Um, baseball was my first love because uh, Dave Winfield was in the outfield of our San Diego Padres there in Jack Murphy Stadium. 1978, Major League Baseball All-Star Game comes to San Diego. For those who have a Google box near them, please. <laughs> there's 50 players. I believe 44 of them are in the Hall of Fame. Wow. That's the year after. Um, Reggie Jackson hits three home runs in the World Series. So there's Reggie Jackson. There's all the, the, the players from the Big Red Machine. Joe Morgan, Johnny Bench, uh, Yaskrimski, Pete Rose. Pete Rose. Mm -hmm. It was. I have an autograph book somewhere at my mother's house that if I ever really get into a pinch, I could sell that on eBay for a lot of money. It's upsides my family. Long uh, preamble into the question, which is, Pittsburgh has found a way to win multiple championships in a small market. San Diego, the last championship that was won, was won by my father in the 1963 AFL championship. 
They beat the Boston Patriots at the time, uh, 50 to 10. What is it about San Diego um, that we're missing? Or is this Padre team real led by a unique phenomenon, which is Fernando Tatis? So I'll start off with this. Um, I think this Padres team this year is for real. And I think that um, it's been a really long time since the Padres have had a big time superstar. And, and I'm not even sure that Tony Gwynn, for all of his greatness, was ever the superstar that Tatis is today. And we can talk about the different media then and now. Um, but he, this kid is good looking and he's young and he plays this position where he's involved in, in it seems like every play and he hits bomb home runs and, and, and the Padres have made a really long-term serious financial commitment to this kid and, and making that commitment to him makes the commitment to the fan base. So that's exciting. And, and there's no question that the Padres have completely taken over the San Diego sports marketplace and anybody who's listening right now might be snickering saying, yeah, because there's nothing else left. That's right. You know, the Chargers, <laughs> this this was a Charger town from the time your dad was playing until the time they moved through highs and lows. This was always a Charger town. Well, when the Chargers left, the Padres still weren't very good, but now they are. And that's what this city needed was a, a team to capture the imagination of what it could be to win a championship. I would always say on the radio, man, I'm jealous of Tampa Bay. I'm jealous of Kansas City. How can these small market teams with low budgets actually really compete against the Yankees or the Giants, the Dodgers, the Cubs, et cetera? Um, and so this particular um, generation of the Padres is for real and it's very exciting and they've made the financial commitment. But, you know, Howard, I think the more time you spend in Pittsburgh, the more you're going to find this out. And even as more people come into Pittsburgh who are not native Pittsburghers, um, Pittsburgh is one of those places where people, um, generations, spend their lives there. Um, great grandparents into grandparents, into your folks, into me, into my kids, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, people spend generations in Pittsburgh and they have pride in Pittsburgh. They love Pittsburgh. You know, they say yins. OK, I'm telling you, they, it, 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 Pittsburgh is one of those places where you may have an entire generation um, of your family. And, and, and people love the Steelers. They live and die with the Steelers. And, and they believed in the Penguins. And, and before they even had PNC Park, back in the old days of Three Rivers, they loved the Pirates. And you talk about that 78 year that you went to the All-Star game. I mean, Willie Stargell and, and, Dave, Parker. and Dave Parker and these kinds of players, I mean, they were, they were superstar celebrity heroes in that town because they represented Pittsburgh. Um, and so, you know, Pittsburgh is one of those kinds of towns in America. And what we used to say in San Diego all the time was, well, why don't the, why don't the Chargers sell out? And people would say, well, there's so many other things to do in San Diego. And, you know, I never really bought that. But when the Chargers left and you only had the Padres, people do have lots of other stuff to do when you've got the best weather in the country. And you've got, you know, just you've got the mountains over here and the beach over here. Mm -hmm. And there's just, there is a lot of life to live when you're not committing it to, uh, to sports, to pro sports. Um, and uh, I listen, I love Pittsburgh. I love the vibe. I love how much people love that town. Yeah. So, you know, you and I talk privately uh, from time to time. Just want to say publicly here, Scotty, appreciate what you're doing with your platform. Not the, just the allyship. It's the enunciation of what you believe being a, a small town guy now back in a small town, not afraid to call out your bosses when they missed up, not afraid to call out your coworkers, especially some of uh, John Browner takes. <laughs> with Browner, I, I am I am 100% with him on 50% of the stuff that he says. <laughs> you can do the math on that one. Uh, please keep, uh, you know, stretching out. Please continue to, we wish you great success with Cited. We wish you continued success with ESPN and Kaplan and crew. And there are a whole bunch of folks that are listening that you probably don't get to interact with on the YouTube uh, chat, uh, but I'm one of them. Well, how I really appreciate you and share you as well. Thank you guys so much for having me. You know, it's, it's so interesting. I, I was so impressed 
when I started to see you doing these sorts of podcasts and then posting them on LinkedIn. And then when you invited me, I was like, oh my God, this is such a great opportunity for me to reach a whole new audience of people. Right. Um, because, you know, listen, you guys know, I mean, it is a struggle when you are an entrepreneur and, and you have something that I swear to you guys, I think about this stuff before I go to sleep. And it is the first thing I think about when I wake mm -hmm. up in the morning and whether it's fundraising or it's, it's looking for uh, strategic partnerships um, or it's, it's iterating um, the, the actual, uh, the actual software itself. I mean, it is what motivates me and drives me. And, you know, a friend of mine said to me last night, this is just ironic, but a friend of mine said to me last night, cause he knows that we're going through our own struggles, meaning, you know, look, we've raised money. We've spent a bunch of money. We got to go back out and raise more. We got to keep convincing our investors that this is a worthwhile thing to keep, you know, believing it. And my, my friend to me, said to me last night, he goes, everybody invested in you, everybody mm -hmm. invested in your, the fact that you will never quit that you are relentless, yep. that you, and, and the other thing he said to me, and it really resonated with me, he said, we, we invested in you because of your relationships and the ability to go out and get meetings with the CEO of Sports Illustrated or the CEO of Fan Sided or the CEO of Vox Media. You know, we invested in you and the relationships and the network that you've created. So, you know, don't quit, keep going, keep believing, you know, keep iterating um, and, and, and just, and that I love that message, you know, and I, I so how and share. Thank you very much for what you're saying. I really do appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for joining us. You were phenomenal. We gained so much, so much insight from from your experiences, your perspective and everything that you're doing right now. We are excited about the future of not only your shows, your your platforms on, um, on in the media, but also with sided it, it just sounds like a fantastic platform that's worth well, playing thanks. with. Well, I, would, I hope everybody will download the app. It's on, on Apple. It's on Google. Our latest build was just approved by Apple. So I'm really excited about how great it looks and how colorful and how visually stimulating it is. Um, and, and it's one of those things, you know, it's kind of like Instagram, you know, you flip through your like, 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 you know mm -hmm. what, I'm going to stop and comment here. It's kind of the same deal. It's like, you know, here's the questions, you know, vote vote. But you know what? I have a strong opinion. I'd like to get involved here. And then it's really interesting to see how people come back and chat with you. And one of the nicest parts about it is, you know, Twitter is such a nasty world. Yeah. It is such a mean spirited, nasty world. What we have found is by posing the question and having people be specific to that content, it is a much more civilized conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I would really like to do is clean up the conversation in social media because man, have we gotten nasty to one another. Yeah, well, definitely everybody needs to tap that app with two Ps. And <laughs> um, in, the mean, <laughs> in the meantime, thank you guys so much for watching and listening. You've been watching and listening. Icons and Insights powered by C360. Make sure you check us out on the next episode.